Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're delighted to get back to a little bit of normality. Uh, there seems to be a bit of quiet confidence that's uh, returning to the streets. Uh, and now that the holiday season, the summer holidays are becoming a distant memory, I guess, for most of us uh, at this point, the nights are drawing in, the kids are going back to school. Um, I think by now it's really time to start thinking forward to November, uh, November the 3rd in particular, and the AIB Merchant Services Retail Excellence Awards. Yes, we're back, uh, albeit a bit virtually this time round, but uh, that is the nature of things at the moment, isn't it? Um, we have a fabulous program that we're working on for you. Uh, it's going to be hosted, as always, by the very effervescent Hector when we finally get to the night, uh, and we'll be celebrating the very best of Irish retail at its resilient and creative best. So really looking forward to the 3rd of November. I know the majority of you today are uh, on this webinar because you've successfully jumped the first of the hurdles that we've put in your way. Uh, in, other, in other words, you've received your mystery shopping reports and you've made it through to be one of the top 125 retailers across Ireland. So the first thing for me to say is congratulations. Well done getting this far. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to the man of the moment, the man that will be familiar to most of you, and that is Matthew Brown. And Matthew will list, lift the lid on phase two of the process and show you examples of brilliant retail, uh, what's come before, and hopefully what's going to come in the future. Um, but first, I'm going to hand over for a few minutes to Robbie Doherty, uh, Director of Product for our main sponsors, AIB Merchant Services. Robbie's going to say a few words by way of perhaps a little bit of an appetizer for you, uh, and then he'll come back to me. Robbie, over to you. Thanks, thanks for that, Duncan. And, uh, you know, AIB Mess are very much, very delighted to be part of the Retail Excellence Awards again this year. Um, Really congratulations to all people on board who've made the shortlist, who have now started down this process. Um, the good news is I'm only the, the warm-up act for, for, for Matthew. Matthew will take over the majority of this. What we did want to do is we just wanted to run through very briefly, you know, some of the things that we've been doing during, during COVID and the sort of tools that may be available to, to your business. Now, we during the overall period, we've seen a significant shift from, from cash to cards. You know, and that's continued at each of the stages of, of reopening. We've seen significant differences in the amount of cash uh, disappearing and, and, and cards being used. What that gives us is that gives us a situation whereby we can now start to extract some information from those customers. You know, who they are, how often they shop with you, um, are they new customers, are they returning customers, where do they live? So it's really, you know, we can start to use that information to make that back, that information available back to you so that you can use it then to help you run your own business um, smartly. So there are some of the use cases, you know, profiling customers for Facebook, for Facebook advertising. You know, we all still have the leaflet drops, you know, we still get leaflets in the door, but, you know, by utilising the tool, you'll be able to see where your customers are coming from, where they're not coming from, and maybe target some of those areas. So, you know, it, it really, um, you know, the best part of this is that all the data is, is anonymized. We're able to do this because of the AIBMS market share, along with the AIB bank issuing data. So all the information is, you know, it doesn't get down to the individual cardholder, but it allows you to see who they are, where they've come from and things like that. So lots of use cases, you know, reporting back up to the head office in terms of demographics. And um, if you have a franchise, the franchisee business you're involved in, sharing that information with other franchisee holders and seeing what you can do better together. We're in that. Um, can you move on there, James, please? Yeah. Well, what we've done here is we, we've just taken, you know, there's, there's lots of use case for this, but we've taken here a small business owner. It's a butcher shop in Terranur, five employees. And what we've done is we've looked at the data that's available to him. So, you know, you can see there is top customer segments, male, female, various age profiles, and they're all in that. So, you know, it, it shows that the males and females, 35 to 44, make up the majority of, of his customers. That probably just reflects who goes to that store, but he's probably never had that information and never had it in the sort of time frames that this is available. You know, each, it's constantly tracked, but it's updated every single day. So you can check yesterday, today, we're in that. The second element is it starts to show where his customers live. 
and you can see the various areas there. The purple one is, is the most is the most profile area, which as it happens is actually Terra Nera, and it shows that the majority of his customers do come from within that area. But then you start, you know, he's attracting customers, he doesn't necessarily attract customers from Harold's Cross, from Kimmins, from Ratmines, from Portobello. They're all quite close, but not as many customers. That may help him to decide how he targets those. So what he does then, having that information, he then looks at, okay, let's run a Facebook campaign. And he asks his Facebook to specifically target a certain age group and a certain profile of where they actually live. Hence, enabling them to be quite specific in, who's, in who, direct, who they can actually target. Can you just move on, James? So you, you see within that now, he ran the campaign for two weeks and then he starts to see where the customers are actually coming from. So he gets the additional information. What he can see from that is that he's, he's attracted 184. His number of new customers is 184, which is actually up 30 people. So the key outcome being that he's spent a small bit of marketing money with Facebook, but has had the desired effect of him attracting new customers within that. So, you know, part of this is, I mean, it's access to your dashboard. I mean, may, you know, maybe not everyone is an ABMS customer, but, you know, the, 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 certainly the, the, the bulk of them will be, but, you know, you know we're, we're more than willing to have to take people on board. So what there is there is there's a dashboard, and this is available in time, and it just shows you, basically, on a weekly basis or a daily basis or a monthly basis, what your current revenue is, and compares that with week on week, month on month, wherever that, that needs to be. It compares your average ticket size, you know, is it up or down on last week, the number of new customers and the number of returning customers. So obviously those returning customers, they're the ones that you actually want and you don't want to see that number actually dropping off. And, you know, you always want to attract new customers. So utilizing that too, you have that information available to you very, very quickly. You know, again, just this this just goes into a little bit more detail around where my customers actually live. So it's just it's it's all calculated within you know up to five kilometers, five to ten kilometers. Now, hopefully, <laughs> there's no more future lockdowns, and we're we're not trying to see who people are are people traveling outside of that five or ten kilometer zone, but it allows you to see exactly where your customers are actually coming from. So really useful. You now, if if you're if you're expanding, if you're looking at opening a second outlet. This information is available to you very, very quickly. Now, we, we, we ran a pilot on this at the, at the very, um, around May time. And this is just some of the, the feedback we got from merchants. Now, the general feeling was really useful. It allows me to see things in real time. It allows people to see their increase in business during COVID. Or particularly, you know, one of the things we'll have picked up on very quickly within this is, how much people are now shopping locally. And, you know, whether that's buying their coffee in the morning, whether that's picking up their few bits and pieces. Now, the hope for us would be that that local spend actually stays in place. You now, we're also involved with Champion Green. I'm sure other people are as well. So, you know, we can actually track that local spend. And we've seen it. We've seen the spend move from the city centre out to the suburbs. And this is just further proof of that. And it shows up really, really quickly within that. Um, you know, you see the last... Point there, I'd like to know more about the definition of competitors. We're in that space. We can only share that information with you if there is enough competitors within a radius. So, you know, you have to have a minimum of 10 of 10 competitors within that space. So based on the type of business you are, we will expand out that, that competitor space so you can actually, you are comparing yourself. This is no use to us if there's, you know, there's two florists in one town and they're just seeing each other's data. It doesn't go down to that level. There has to be a minimum number of competitors. And based on the tool and the demographics, we will push the, those kilometers out. So you're actually getting a really good comparison within that. Look, it was really just to give you, give people an idea of the sort of information that's available, the ease at which this information is available to you. Um, this deck could be sent on and there's a link within that that will, that will point to where you can actually register for this service. It's a very simple sign up process. It's very much in line with the ABMS digital strategy. Now, as part of this, we will convert you from a paper statement to a digital statement, which means you get it on, on the first day of the month, and then you start to get access to this tool. There's no cost for this. 
It's what we really want in this. We want people to be using this and getting the data from that to help you drive your business forward. That's that's as much as I have. So look, no, best of luck in the awards going forward. It's a shame that we won't get to have that night out. I know a lot of effort goes into on, on the REI side of having those nights out and they are typically a really, really good night. So hopefully next year we do all get to do this in person. Thank you. Robbie, thanks a million for that. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a few people going in, uh, online and having a look and uh, uh, signing up for that. Brilliant. Um, look, guys, uh, thanks, Rob, thanks to Robbie. Thanks for uh, everything you do. And thanks again to AIB Merchant Services for being our key sponsors uh, for the awards again this year, which will be run virtually on the 3rd of November. So, so look, guys, um, I'm going to introduce Matthew in a second. It's been a long and difficult road. Um, but I'm delighted to welcome Matthew back to, to Ireland, albeit virtually and probably from a, a, a living room somewhere in Cheltenham or somewhere in Gloucestershire anyway, Matthew, I think it is. It uh, is. It's my office at the top of the house. Your, your office. Great stuff. Uh, Matthew has been providing us with the Need to Know series throughout the pandemic. So uh, I know there's some fantastic examples of really great, great retail on that. And for members, you know, you can access that uh, through our website. He's an expert in retail from across the world, uh, and I'm also delighted that he's agreed to join us as our key judge uh, for the awards again for this year. Um, Matthew's presentation, I think Matthew's going to last about, what, 55 minutes or so. Um, so if there are any questions, we may not get to them before uh, time runs out, but uh, if you do have any questions, please drop them into the chat box. If we do have some time at the end, we'll pick them up. Otherwise, uh, we'll endeavour to get back to you uh, with any answers uh, separately by email. Matthew, over to you. Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, thanks very much, Robbie. Um, welcome to everyone. I see that we've got 152 participants online. Um, normally, I'm in the wonderful AIB headquarters in Dublin to do this presentation. Unfortunately, we're still doing virtual presentations. Um, but, you know, I think we're all kind of used to them. Um, and hopefully, we still find them interesting and uh, inspiring. Look, I've got let's say till four o'clock to do this. I've got loads to run through, um, but I'm gonna try and make it as quick as possible. And ultimately I'm just gonna show you loads of really great examples of retail. It's a real celebration of the excellence that we've seen in retail in this presentation um, over the past few years, since I've had the honor of doing the Story of the Year judging. I did the Story of the Year judging in 2017, 18 and 19. Obviously 2020 was a strange year. Um, I'm delighted to be back again for 2021, and this will be my first trip out of the UK in almost 18 months. Having gone from travelling and flying twice a week to absolutely nothing, it's been a very, very strange year. Um, look, my job today really is to explain the next part of the process to get you to the top 30 stores um, and to then to get through to the awards. I'm going to show it with examples of great um, previous awards uh, retail um, and explain the process of what you need to do for the next submission. Um, the first thing I want to say, of course, is congratulations to you guys. You've made it through to the top 125 and you've made it through to the top 125 because you've gone through that really important first hurdle, which is the mystery shopping. And I know sometimes it's a contentious issue in terms of the judging because some great stores fall at, the, uh, fall at that first hurdle. But ultimately, as we all know with retail, if your service is just, just not up to par, then it doesn't matter how great your, how great your store looks, how great your product looks. Um, you're just not going to get that customer loyalty and you're not going to get the store, you know, you're not going to get the, the sales that you need. So service is absolutely one of the key planks of retail excellence. And you guys have already passed that through um, to get through to the top 125 stores. You need to have had a really good mystery shopping um, uh, score. So congratulations on that. Now the question is, how do you get through from top 125 down to the next phase, which is the top 30 stores? at which point I will then do the top 30 road trip um, around Ireland and we head towards the awards on the night of the uh, virtually of November. Um, I just wanted to make the point, guys, if you haven't entered to the next stage of the top 30, I really hope you will do. And it's not just a plug for me. Um, I hope you don't think that it's just about winning an award. We have genuinely designed this award process as a learning experience and as a way for you to think critically about your business, to step outside potentially and look at it from a new set of eyes and to say, what are we doing really well? And potentially, what could we do to improve? And there have been quite a few examples of retail 
retailers who've entered the awards in previous years, who didn't do so well, but have improved year on year. And in fact, Willow Ennis in 2018 went from a top 30 store to the winner because they had implemented learnings, because Jean McKay had implemented learnings from that pillars of excellence. So I hope you will find this explanation of our 10 pillars of excellence useful to help you do the award um, submission yourself, but also to learn to celebrate great stuff and so forth. Um, look, we were supposed to be here in 2020. I have to say, you can't talk about retail without talking about 2020. I've been talking about the retail apocalypse for 10 years in terms of the kind of move towards online and the challenge for physical retail. 2020 was the year that the retail apocalypse really happened. And if I had to choose one picture to illustrate 2020, it's this one. It's Times Square, April 2020, during lockdown, and the place is totally deserted. These are the type of scenes, and they were replicated in cities around the world, of almost a zombie apocalypse style retail. And it has been a genuine catastrophe for a whole swathe of retail. Big brands have gone, some department stores have had a, a really difficult time. We've lost Debenhams, we've lost House of Fraser's, we've lost Topshop, we've lost some big established brands. At the same time, retail has not stopped. There is genuinely been acceleration of creativity. I'm hoping that we're going to be celebrating that new creativity in the awards this year. But certainly, I'm still looking around the world, looking at retail innovation, and it has not stopped at all. In fact, it's accelerated. What 2020 and the retail apocalypse has really taught us is just how essential retail is. Um, and cities, we now understand how important office workers are, how important tourists and out of towners, this creating a retail ecosystem that brings cities to life. And without that, it feels really dead and empty. Um, conversely, as Robbie said, and the data shows it, it's been a very interesting year for small independent local retail because some retail has thrived. Um, and we really, I do believe this, I've been saying this for many years, that it's never been as good a time to be small, independent, nimble, local and creative. And so this year, really, as part of the awards, the underlying sentiment that I really want to to kind of seek out and really find examples of, um, is examples of resilience in the time of crisis, real creativity, whether that's updating your store design, whether it's telling new stories, whether it's creating new types of personal service, or it's amazing visual merchandising, all of that type of creativity, we're looking out for that. If you can show us examples of that, that's gonna score really highly in the, in the awards, but equally for customers, that's what we want to see now that we're desperate to get back into shops, back to restaurants, back to living life the way we, we used to. You know, it's been a very long 18 months um, and we're ready to bounce back. We absolutely want to celebrate that. Um, and then the final part of it is community. You know, we've really understood the power of pulling together, of being part of a local community, of being part of a town's ecosystem, of retail ecosystems. We understand how important that retail ecosystem is in light of the disaster that's happening in cities. Without everyone working together and pulling together, you know, we don't create these vibrant retail ecosystems that we all need for life, for business, for everything together. So this year's awards is really going to be about celebrating these three elements. Um, and as I said, the next stage is to take 125 stores. I'm hoping 125 of you are going to, going to enter your stores and go through your submissions I'm going to get and I'm going to run through how you how you complete these submissions and do the best job you possibly can. And it's going to narrow down with me judging virtually sitting here in my office in Cheltenham down to top 30. And then my favorite part of the journey um, is a week long trip um, across Ireland, like I did in 2017, 18 and 19 to visit the top 30 stores in person. Um, and then those will then be selected and scored down to the final awards ceremony in November. Um, I've always been blown away by the standards of retail excellence across Ireland, across every retail sector. And what's really nice is seeing retail excellence across small fashion boutiques, across supermarkets, across big, big brand department stores, shopping malls, coffee stores, everyone. There is absolute um, passion, expertise and creativity in every sector. And I'm hoping we're going to see an equally great spread um, this year. So that's the journey to the top 30. How do we get to top 30? 
The really important thing is this document that you can see at the top, this PowerPoint submission document. This is going to be what helps you get from top 125 down to the top 30, because you are going to show me what your stores look like based upon the 10 pillars of retail excellence, which I'm going to run through. This is the way that we judge the store of the year, the 10 things that we think make retail really good. And I have to say previous top 30 stores and previous winning stores haven't necessarily been perfect across every single pillar, but they have certainly scored highly across all of them. And I genuinely believe that if you have a store that scores highly across all of that, you are genuinely offering an amazing customer experience to your, to your customers. Um, and you should see the results in terms of your sales and your performance and everything else. It's what makes retail vibrant um, and so forth. So as of four o'clock this afternoon, you should have three documents, the three documents that are listed here. You should have a PowerPoint document called Store Retail Excellence Top 125 Application 2 to 2021. What I would like you guys to do when you apply is to change the name store for your store name so that I can see it when I'm judging it. So because otherwise I'm going to get 125 files that all look the same. So if you could change that name in the file structure and then fill out the PowerPoint document, document, um, that would be great. And then to help you do that, essentially, we have two supporting documents. We have um, this presentation today, which is Retail Excellence Store of the Year Top 125 Briefing. And this contains uh, my favorite a selection of examples of great um, uh, retail across those 10 pillars from previous Top 30 uh, Store Awards. Um, in Ireland. And then the second document is defining retail excellence, which is a wider, more international look about what does the 10 pillars of retail excellence look like. Now, both of those, I hope, are interesting, inspiring, and show loads of examples of really great retail. It should just be an interesting read, highly visual, uh, hopefully inspirational, and it should give you a good idea of what type of thing we're looking for in terms of that store submission. Now, look, I'm just going to quickly run through what this PowerPoint document looks like um, before I get on with my examples of the 10 pillars. Um, this is the document that you're gonna get. Store Retail Excellence Top, uh, top 100 2021 application. It's a PowerPoint document. You guys should be able to open it. If any of you have any problems with it, please get in touch with us. We'll make sure it works. Um, this is the template. There's a welcome page, an explanation. And then this is the first bit that you have to complete. If you put your store name and your store address in, um, that just lets me know. Um, I, in an ideal world, I would have hours to look at every, every submission. However, I am allocating 15 minutes maximum to look at each store, which takes me a full solid five days of judging, looking at my computer with eight hours a day. So as you can imagine, it's a fairly intensive job. Um, and the easier you make it for me, the more visual you make it for me, the better I can make a, ju a judgment, because at this stage, I'm not visiting your store. So in order for me to come and visit your store, I have to have already judged you down to the top 30. So the better the job you can do, um, you know, the more likely you are to get through to the top to the top 30. Um, the next page just explains these 10 pillars. And this is what I'm going to run through for the rest of the hour. So you don't need to pay particular attention to it now. Um, but what you are going to do is you are going to photograph your store according to every one of those 10 pillars. So you are going to have 10 pages that look like this that you need to fill out. And you need to put a photo for each of the pillars onto this template and write a little bit of text along the side to explain what you think you're doing within this category. What makes it good? How have you changed? How have you been resilient? How have you shown creativity? Now, the template shows four slots for pictures, but those pictures, if you put four in on each page, are not going to be, be very big. So please feel free to delete three of those boxes and expand one box and do one great picture per page. If you feel that that shows off what you guys are doing, how the store looks, so that I can see that sitting here at my desk, please do it. Um, in previous years, I have to say that the people who have photographed their stores the best 
I'm not suggesting necessarily that you have to get a professional photographer in to do it, but if you want to, that certainly adds benefit and it adds impact to what you're doing. It makes your stores look as good as they possibly can. Please photograph them in their most flattering light. Please photograph them so that you're really showing visually what you are doing in each of those pillars. Make it look as good as you possibly can, and then I will be able to see it in its best possible light. So as we say, there's 10 pillars. Um, you've, you've got 10 pages to fill out plus the title one. Um, that's the document that's going to come back to me in September, the beginning of September, and I'm going to sit there for a week and judge all of that. Then that will come out to the top 30. And as I said, in the first week of October, I think the 4th of October, I will be traveling around on my first road trip out of the UK um, to visit the best of Irish retail again. I'm super excited about it. Really looking forward to meeting you guys in person. Hoping, I know there's a few stores already that have been in previous top 30. So you guys, hopefully I will see you guys again. Um, so look, that's the PowerPoint. Um, again, if you have any questions with that, please ask at the end of this session or send emails or call us. We're here to help. We're here to make that process as easy and as seamless as possible. Um, so those are the three documents. Um, the application form and this presentation, which and also I understand that this presentation is being recorded, so there should be plenty of reference material for you. So before further ado, we have half an hour and I'm going to try and stick to three minutes per uh, category. Um, this is how we judge the store of the year. It's on this idea called the 10 pillars of retail excellence. Shopfront, windows, first bite, visual merchandising, store design, curation, personalization, storytelling, hospitality and community, and technology. Now, it's really hard. How on earth do you really judge the excellence of a store? Surely 10 pillars is roughly arbitrary. But as I said, actually, over the past four years, we found that it's really quite a resilient way of judging. Uh, how well a store looks, how good the customer experience is, um, how solid the retail offer is. Um, and, and so we're going to stick with it. Um, and uh, so it's loosely based around five themes. The first one, obviously, the first impression that customers see. We understand after 2020, we know there's been this shift towards online, but I genuinely believe that physical retail is as important as ever. All of those retail basics continue to be important, continue to anchor us into our communities. We want to get out, we want to see, we want surprise and delight, and all of this is part of that same element of what makes physical retail so great. So look, the first category, surprise and delight, first impressions, the shop front, it's a fairly self-explanatory topic. I don't need to go on a huge amount about it. What I'm saying that we celebrate, we celebrate the architectural heritage of shops. If you are lucky enough to have inherited a shop front that has that architectural heritage, that brand tradition, that you can then take that and run with it, then brilliant. Obviously, these are some of the shop fronts that are the most iconic around the world. Bewley's, um, you know, it reopened after an expensive refurb. It looked like it was going to be a casualty of, of, of 2020, of the, of, of the COVID crisis. It looks like it's been saved. We're delighted to see that. But this is, you know, this is what we mean when we say great shop fronts. Fantastic, iconic, uniquely designed, permanent um, face on the high street. It anchors, it doesn't just do a great job on its own. It gives the street that it sits on character. And that's a really integral part of what makes a great shop front. It's not just about you and the business that you run. It's about how you sit and enhance the face of the town and the shopping streets that you sit along. It's great to have a traditional shop front. Equally, contemporary shop fronts can be just as dramatic. I love this example. This isn't a high street. This is an out of town. This is Bike World in Dublin. Huge contemporary space. But what a dramatic combination of a window and a shop front together with these with these um, motorbikes sitting in the window. Again, world class shop front. Um, you know, Irish design, I've always said, is absolutely world class. Um, there is no excuse. Um, you know, and, and I always said that top 30 stores could sit equally comfortably alongside any of the stores in the rest of the world. Contemporary shop front here at Bike World Dublin. Again, 
you know, you can have a big shop front, you can have a small high street shop front. We're not being prescriptive about what makes a good shop front. It's about what you do with what you've been given, how creative you are around it. Willow in Ennis, small independent retailer, fantastic winner of, of, of Retail Excellence Store of the Year in 2018. Uh, Jean constantly improved over the over the awards process. She's taken a traditional shop front, painted it in her brand colours to give it that distinctive contemporary traditional look, and then elevated the exterior with planters and with this lovely tone of voice. Really simple approach and making the very best of what you've got. This is what we look for in terms of great shop fronts. Um, over in, over in London, Paul Smith, his flagship store in Covent Garden, been there 30 years. Um, the shop front itself doesn't change, but he keeps it fresh by continually painting the facade. It's a really simple, creative and low cost solution. It's so typically Paul Smith. He paints the facade just in his brand colors. What a simple, creative, easy approach to take. It just shows that creativity does not have to cost a huge amount of money. You do not need an expensive shop front like Bugley's or by Bike World. You can do great things with small, small uh, elements that you have. Um, again, over to another repeated top 30 store, Mellorix in Fomoy, uh, repeated uh, Pharmacy of the Year and top 30. Fantastic fantastic shop front on the high street, a great non-traditional colour that you wouldn't expect from a pharmacy, great frontage onto the high street. The reason I'm showing it is that they pay equal attention to other entrances at the same time. And that might be one of the things that you want to feature. If you have multiple shop fronts, I would love to see how you are treating all of them. Are you treating each shop front with, with, with a level of creativity and passion? What I particularly love about this is the car park entrance for Click and Collect and Pharmacy. Um, put up a graphic. This is this graphic wall that you can see here is attached to the, to the old building. Um, it's a way of dressing it. They didn't need to do it, but it shows that real sense of investment in the experience, even in the welcome, that first impression really, really important. So the shop front, we know it. Let's see what you're doing with shop front. The second part of first impressions, the things that we know that we love from retail is the shop window. And the shop window is going to continue to be more important than ever. Certainly during lockdown, I was struck by how few retailers made the effort to do great windows, but equally at the same time, some retailers even in spite of lockdown, chose that as the opportunity for them to express what they were doing, to say we're looking forward to coming back. Um, I chose this example because this is one of my favourite times of year. This is the whole area of Chelsea in London. And for one week during the year, um, they create these amazing floral uh, window displays um, for the Royal Horticultural Society flower show. It's called Chelsea in Bloom. Um, it didn't run in 2020. It's planned to run for 2022. I'm super excited about it. But 80 of the stores around the area, plus the hotels and restaurants, club together to do something amazing and creative, creating that sense of community so that it becomes a total destination and for that week in 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 spring everyone flocks to chelsea it's massive on instagram um, people are taking pictures it's a celebration it's non-traditional windows but it just shows the power of that traditional physical retail experience um, the theme last year or in 2019 was under the sea i don't know what theme they're doing next year but again it's a storytelling approach to creativity fantastic. It just shows how wonderful retail can be at its absolute best. That's Chelsea in London every year, hopefully next year. Again, across the top 30 stores, we've seen fantastic window displays. One of my very favourite ones was Bambino's Children's Wear in Ennis and um, did this awesome, uh, awesome window with, a, with, a, with a, a little beetle that's poking out of the window. So it's a three dimensional window approach in much the same way as the Chelsea in Bloom. And it continued on to the inside. Just wonderful creativity. This is what makes retail excellent. This is what makes retail resilient and creative. This is what we want to see more of. Um, absolutely stunning example, world-class window. Um, Kilkenny, a regular top 30 store. I know they're back in on the entrance. I loved um, this particular example, a woven window um, at Nassau Street in Dublin. 
Again, fantastic creativity. This is what we want to see from retail, um, you know, showing that you're expert, showing that you're passionate. Um, and I've been showing this example for a few years because I still love it, because I just wanted to make the point that, OK, you're a fashion boutique, you know, you're a children's wear store, you do window displays, that's expected. But actually, it doesn't matter what sector you're in. If you're in the pet sector or the hardware sector, you still can do window displays that are amazing and creative and, more importantly, cheap you don't need to spend a huge amount of money on it i know that jean mccabe from willow set herself a hundred euro budget for her window displays amazing creativity on very very little money you can create a, a sale window that looks better than anything else using an old hose or a, um, you know a, an amazing seasonal display using a bunch of hanging brooms it's all about the passion and expertise and creativity rather than the budget there's no excuse to say i haven't got the money i can't do a good window the examples are absolutely out there um, and I suppose the question some of you might be asking is, well, we don't have a traditional window. What do we do with that? And, you know, in terms of the judging that I do, if a store doesn't have a traditional window, I will look at other elements of what make that first impression great. Here at Insomnia Coffee, I'm just putting out the tables and chairs with a candle and with a, with a throw sends that sense of generosity and welcome. That's absolutely, for me, as important a brand message as creating a wonderful window display. Again, there's no excuse for not doing it. Um, and my final example, Avoca uh, in Dunboyne, previous top 30. We all know Avoca, we know how good they are. But again, they work often with non-traditional units. Um, this greenhouse approach, um, Dunboyne doesn't have the traditional window display, but what they've done instead is taken two tractors and painted them in bright colors. Again, look, I've been showing this picture for a while. I still love it, it ages beautifully. Again, there's no excuse for not being creative and making customers go, wow because that's what we want from retail. So we're two down. The third and final part of first impressions, we've done the shop front, we've looked at the windows. The third part of what a customer sees when they first come across you. They see you out on the street, they look at the window and then they walk through the door. And the first thing they see is what we call first bite. And so this element often People have been a little bit confused in previous years of judging. I just want to make it really clear. This is probably the easiest part of the whole submission process for you guys to, to, to photograph. What I want you to do is to stand at the front of your store and point your camera inside the store and take a picture of what you see because that picture is what customers see at the beginning. That is first bite. And first bite should be the thing that's the transition between the outside and the inside. And it should be where customers go, oh, wow because if they don't, you are missing a trick. This is where you should have hero displays. This is where the design should wow them. This is where the activity of whatever it is that's going on should assail them, the sense of smells and taste and merchandising, the design. Absolutely, this is the part where you are making that first impression. And it is so powerful when you get it right. This is Mellorix in Formoy that showed you the shop front of. This is their first bite, looking into this beautiful vaulted ceiling, which they uncovered as part of their refurb. Previously, it had a, a lowered, lowered modern ceiling. They tore it up. They discovered this old ceiling. It gives that immediate sense of wow and tradition. This is what I mean by first bite. Um, doesn't matter what you are. Again, Apple Green, I know Apple Green are into the top 125. Again, standing at that entrance, looking in, what is that first impression that you get? And, you know, Apple Green consistently rate amongst the top, uh, you know, uh, service and PFS retailers around the world. And for good reason, because this is the experience that customers are getting. This is powerful first bite. Um, I just wanted to make the point that it may be if you've got a small store, you've only got one first bite. With some bigger stores, what you may have is multiple first point, first bites as customers move through the space. And what you can do in that case is to photograph those, each of those ones separately to show that first bite as they transition into a space. And I'm going to use the Evoker in Dunboyne as that example, because as you walk through that main glass entrance, you get through into that florist area. That is the first first bite that people see. But actually, there's a doorway to the left, 
which when you then walk through, you get that second first bite into the fashion um, area. And that again is a second first bite. And you can see that Avoca have considered that. They have absolutely understood that this is the vista that customers are seeing when they first walk in and they have designed and merchandised around that. It didn't happen by accident. And the third part of the Avoca is the garden center offer. And this is me taking the picture um, as I walk in and you see that again, it is a really photogenic, deeply considered first bite approach. And they've done that at every entrance. So potentially you guys, you may have more than one first bite to photograph. Please show me all of them. Show me how you do it, how you think about it, how customers are transitioning and how they're getting that sense of wow as they move through the space. So how are we doing for time? We're okay, we've got 20 minutes left or so. We're into the second part of retail. We've done that first impressions of shop front windows and first bite. This is the really important bit about retail. It's the stuff that turns product into something desirable. You guys are retailers, you're selling a bunch of product, you put it up on shelves. We now live in a world where we can buy everything online. We don't need physical stores in the same way, but we want them and we want great retail. We want retail. We want retail where product looks better inside the store than it does out. This is the opportunity to get creative through visual merchandising, through visual storytelling, through eventing. This is where art meets retail. And I absolutely want to be celebrating this. And um, this was one of my favorite examples from Store of the Year 2019, Windy Ridge Garden Center in Dunleary. Fantastic approach. Um, you know, this lovely seasonal Halloween display, wonderful creativity. The whole store was packed with this type of visual merchandising. This is world-class creativity. You're seeing it in the garden center sector, but equally we're seeing it across in the food sector. Um, beautiful color block merchandising at Fresh in Dublin. Um, and they did that across with produce. They equally took that same amazing visual approach through to their salad bar. I think they have 56 different salads in their salad bar, beautifully merchandised by color, using the mirrors as an extra block, carefully layering that approach at high level so that you can see through to the salad bar, through then to the, to the counter as well. A fantastic example of what great visual merchandising looks like. Visual merchandising is often one of the really best sectors um, in the awards. I've got far too many examples of great ones to show you now, um, but, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys are doing and how you're gonna wow me this year. Um, look, we saw it with Garden Center, with food. There's no excuse for not doing visual merchandising. It doesn't matter who you are. Let's take Insomnia Coffee. It's a coffee shop, but they're still using visual merchandising, lovely cameo props for their accessories range, even in a small bit, just by the welcome. Again, there are plenty of opportunities for creativity wherever you look. And my final example, um, Pet Stop, a consistent top 30 store, one of the very best pet retailers in the world. Uh, I'm not joking, they are consistently superb on visual merchandising. Um, this was their store, top 30 store from Limerick. Uh, a really nice use of traditional gondola ends, which are often used for hero promotions, turned into these themed, um, these themed events with visual merchandising. This was a movie nights one. Um, and even around that, just the core range merchandised with incredible authority, uh, visual, um, visual inspiration, great color blocking. You know, this is what big box merchandising looks like when it's absolutely excellent. Again, there is no excuse for not doing great visual merchandising. You know, you can make bulk commodity products like this look good. You can do that with absolutely anything. Um, you know, this is what physical retail is all about. It's about making the product you sell look better in the store than it does in people's homes. It's about making it look desirable. Um, and we are absolutely gonna be celebrating the best of that. So that second part of surprise and delight, how do we create amazing physical retail experiences that make customers go, wow, we've got the visual merchandising. The second part is interior design. How do we design the stores? How are we designing the customer experience? Um, I just wanted to show you this example because I just wanted to prove that creativity has not stopped during the pandemic. And I'm gonna use this example because they are the most out there brand I know. This is Silpo in Ukraine, part of the Fozzy group. This is a supermarket operator. They have 350 stores, but they have this designer supermarket range, 96 of them, where every single store is different and based around a totally unique theme. 
They have opened 12 designer supermarkets in 2021 alone and 10 in 2020 during the pandemic. Every single one unique. This was a concept that opened in April in the Carpathian Mountains. It's all about the mountain landscape amazing, weird, incredible themed re retail design. This is what supermarkets look like in a world where you guys are shopping at Aldi and Lidl and the discounters and they're fighting over price. There is a world where supermarket customers are getting these amazing themed environments. This is Mountain Extreme in the Ukraine in Silpo. This is their Circus Excellence. This opened in March this year, all dedicated to celebrating circus performers with no animals. Um, this was an amazing steampunk concept that launched at the beginning of the year. Everything about steampunk theming. They had a full size steam blowing aircraft above the produce department. Every store is unique. It is a massive investment in design. It is quite astonishing. They are continuing to win the European Supermarket Store of the Year awards. Um, amazing stuff. And my final example was the Sleepo Silpo Diner concept, again, with a full American diner inside the store, everything themed around the American diner, um, from gondola aisles through to flooring, through to neon lighting. Fabulous creativity, fun, playful, lovely. This is the great, the great side of retail creativity, and it happened, and it's happening now in the middle of the pandemic. They didn't slow down their store openings in 2020, 2021. They've they've increased them and accelerated them. So I've shown you the bonkers world of Silpo in Ukraine. You're thinking, what on earth does that have to do with Ireland? As I said, Irish retail has long been world class. Lifestyle Sports in Cork was a top 30 store back in 2017. Their fantastic flagship. I said it then, I still say it now. The design of that was as good as the Nike and Adidas flagships that you're seeing in London and New York and Paris. Absolute world class design uh, and experience from an independent retailer. Now, look. They spent plenty of money on it, um, plenty of budget. You don't need to spend a huge amount of money on having great retail design. Of course, it helps, but it's about that focus and that creativity. Um, Shannon, uh, you know, one of the world's best duty free stores. You know, unfortunately, the travel retail sector has been so badly hit by, by, the, by the crisis. We really hope it's going to bounce back. Uh, but this was a fantastic example of great curated a wonderful wow design with this great living wall that anchored the space. Um, but to make the point that you don't have to, again, be a major retailer with a huge budget, back to Bambinos in Ennis, who did that wonderful window display. They created a non-traditional looking children's store, one of the most charming looking spaces. It's a small footprint. They got a local carpenter to do it and they created this beautiful little playhouse for the kids. Beautiful design. It does not look like a standard shop. Charming retail design at a budget, small independent retail, showing how creative they are. And my final example in this world of that is again showing that there's no excuse. It doesn't matter what sector you're in. You can offer customers an amazing retail experience with great world-class design, no matter what you do. Malloy's in Tala, independent uh, off-license retailer. This was their flagship store after a refurbishment. Fantastic, one of the world's best looking off licenses with this beautiful vaulted ceiling that looks like a star filled wine cellar. Retail design, really important. It's absolutely one of the 10 pillars of retail excellence. So we're getting through. I thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> we're on to category six, four more to go. We've done the first impressions. We've done the surprise and delight. This third pillar of what makes great retail great is expert solutions. It's about you showing that you're not just selling product, but you understand how customers want to buy, understand the problems that they have, that you can offer solutions rather than ever more choice, that you can filter that to present it, to make it look good and to make complicated things simple and easy to understand. Um, and that's what I'm really looking for in terms of solution. How are you presenting solutions, grouped products, understanding how customers live their life and then how to how to solve that. Uh, this carpet studio by Casey's Furniture in Limerick, a really nice, simple one wall approach showing how you get your carpet fitted. We all know what a stressful process that is. You know it's going to be expensive. You don't know what, you know, so many options. It's a really frustrating and often um, troublesome task doing that. They've made that simple, easy and accessible and they've done that through curation. Great example of that. But as I said, 
Doesn't matter what sector you're in, you can curate no matter what you're selling. Evergreen Health Foods in Galway using their gondola ends as hero ends for hero products and explaining how you can use it. What are the benefits of coconut oil? All of that type of stuff as a piece of communication. It's bringing out a product, it's highlighting it, it's showing how customers can use it in real world situations. That is the essence of curation. It's what turns you from being a supplier into an expert. Um, again, over at Mellorix, really nice touch where you actually get the staff involved, where the staff become the expert and the staff have a face at, in front of the customer um, that's actually built into the store design. You have Mike's motto here written in as point of sale. Again, a really nice point of sale approach that looks like it's a blackboard printed out with a bit chunkier, so it's not the standard point of sale approach the photo, and then little secrets with a nice little tone of voice at the same time. It's a really nice piece of curated communication. Um, and then my final example, again, back from Shannon. Um, again, you know, if you've got expert staff, we want to celebrate them. We want to give them a voice, show what their choices are, show their expertise, let them help customers and celebrate them as part of that store design. That is, again, a really important element of that expertise. Um, and that brings me neatly through to uh, another element of expert solutions, which is uh, personalization. Um, it's been a growing trend. It continues to be important. One of the things that we've seen over lockdown um, and as, as retailers came out with is the rise of personal shopping. One of the ways to counter um, you know, the rise of online is to offer added value services when you can't bring as many customers in at the same time. You can book appointments. We've seen the massive rise of appointment retail. It really adds value in terms of personal service, driving loyalty. I'd be really interested to see what you guys have done in terms of maybe personal shopping. The other side of personalization is turning a product from being a commodity into something precious and personal, and you can do it anywhere. Um, it doesn't need a huge amount of space. It doesn't need a huge amount of budget to do it, but it genuinely transforms the customer's relationship with the product. Um, Lifestyle Sports, the flagship in Cork, a great use of personalization at the cash desk area, combining two functions in one so that you could actually customize your boots, only 10 euros on the customizing embroidery machine behind that. Great use of space personalization right at the front of it. Um, this was another example, really nice, a mobile unit that Echo Shoes put in at Liffey Valley, showing the craftsmanship of the leather that goes into it. It's a lovely piece of brand storytelling and interactive retail theater and personalization at the same time. You've got the guy there doing it, working on it, adding some personalization elements. There again is no excuse not to be doing something personal. There are loads of different ways to interpret it. And I'd love to see the ways that you guys are doing that, thinking about it creatively and adding value to the experience. Um, Harvey Norman over in Tala, their fantastic flagship packed with great stuff. One of my favorite little things that I just hadn't seen before just shows how you can do personalization in all kinds of different areas with this find my perfect pillow offer that they had up against a wall that could have pre presumably just been an unused space. You stand your back, put your back against the wall, you use that fitting, it finds the perfect fit for a pillow. What a fantastic piece of added value service to a traditional homeware offer. Again, really nice creativity. I'd love to see more of that. Um, and my final example, one of my favorite things that I saw back in 2019 over at Insomnia Coffee, you take a selfie and have your picture printed onto a cup of coffee. And there, if you can see in the light, they printed out in 30 seconds, uh, my miserable looking face onto a cup of coffee. Um, and just what a lovely way of creating Instagram ability, talk ability, a little bit of fun. Um, just a great example of personalized creativity. I'd love to see new creative ideas like that as well. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. We've, we're running low on time, so I'm gonna try and whiz through. An extension of curation, part of that piece of excellence is about communication. And what I really want to see from you guys is how are you communicating products in store? What does your point of sale look like? What does graphics look like? How are you telling stories about products? It's not just about the price. We want to know more and more detail. And the best communicators 
tell deep, rich stories about their products. And when you do that, you add value to the product that you have. And I always use Fallon and Burnham as an example, because this is an example of how you charge 22 euros for a bottle of olive oil. You can't just charge 22 euros without telling that story, without selling the benefits. And the lovely thing about Fallon and Burn is that they did it with every product. And it's a massive investment. Look, it's an investment of time. It's an investment in consistency. It needs to be managed. But my God, it makes you look like an expert. This is what amazing communication looks like at point of sale. Um, it's not just about what you say in the stories. It's how you say it as well. Um, Garvey Group, fantastic operators of super values. This is their award winning store in Tralee fantastic signage at point of sale, handwritten, artistic, creative storytelling. It's non-traditional. It doesn't look corporate. This is what sets them apart from their competition and makes them look uh, unique and creative and passionate and expert. That again is what we mean by retail excellence. Um, through to storytelling about you and your history and your brand, celebrate it. Kay's Kitchen in Blanchestown telling the story about how Bart travels the world finding the coffee beans and then tells the story with real authentic pictures about how his mother had started it, the history, celebrating heritage. If you have true stories about your business, tell them because there is no limit to the stories that customers want to hear. You know, we absolutely celebrate that. Please show me how you're communicating, show me what you're doing, show me how you're doing it creatively, deep, rich stories, whether it's digital, whether it's physical, it doesn't matter which, it's all about communication and storytelling. Um, and this takes me through to, we've got two categories left. <laughs> Again, thank you for bearing with me. Hospitality and community. Now I've grouped these two together because they're kind of, they're kind of linked. Um, the first one is hospitality. Look, we've understood how important hospitality is after a year of not being able to go out to bars and restaurants. We are groaning for it. But hospitality has been a growing trend in retail for many, many years. For retailers that do not have a traditional hospitality offer, the first thing, the first question we want to know is why are you not adding a hospitality offer, a coffee offer, a restaurant offer, some added value service to do that uh, because it genuinely creates more reasons to come and more reasons to stay. Fabiani, I know they're back in the top 125, a lovely independent business over in Longford, traditionally a shoe retailer. Um, Louise, the owner, put in a coffee store um, a few years ago. Fantastic drive. It transforms a traditional shoe store into another brand, fantastic high street uh, destination. She ran yoga classes in the front of the store, which becomes flexible. And at the back of the store, there's a beauty treatment area. Again, put into the store, added as a hospitality offer, a great addition to adding value to what the, what the shoe store was previously. That is a great example of adding hospitality to retail. Um, Mellorix, they added a new wellness area with a juice bar. Again, it's not a full service hospitality offer, but it's moving towards that direction. That's something that, you know, we would absolutely be celebrating in terms of hospitality and community. Um, if you are a traditional hospitality business, so if you're insomnia, or you're a coffee business or you're a restaurant, clearly you don't get points for being hospitality. The real question is, what are you doing on top of that? How are you adding value to what is, a tr to what is the core of your business? And so we would be looking for really nice creative examples of moving beyond traditional hospitality. I use Avoca in Dunboyne as a really nice example of that. Their kitchen garden had a has a greenhouse which grows the ingredients that are then used in the food cafe for customers and customers sit there in the growing thing. This adds an incredible level of tactile visual storytelling onto the whole process. Um, Insomnia did a really nice community element, an eco element. Uh, eco and sustainability is clearly a part of hospitality and community, a really nice composting approach. Um, and Esquire's Coffee over in Mullingar, clearly a hospitality business. They added value with this separate children's play area with a bit of education, small seating for the children with really nice crayons, and then iPads for educational games. It's adding value to what's traditionally already there in terms of hospitality. Now, look, if you guys are saying, well, we don't have a coffee offer and we're not a hospitality business, but what do we do? I'm also interested in how are you running education classes or added value or expertise within your store? What are you doing to move beyond just selling product? 
to, to, to creating community, to creating expertise. Um, and so mum to be pharmacies, uh, you know, raffles, events, uh, hosted nights, all of those kind of community events, stuff that we can see in store, that is something you guys should definitely be, be showing me. Um, the Mulligans did it here. Um, but look, at Evergreen Pharmacy, they had a really nice bit, bit at the entrance. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be these lovely little touches. Um, they had a little uh, post-it note um, thing at the entrance and the exit where customers could write their own little comments about it. It was a really nice way for customers to get involved in that process, to show that they're part of the community, that the brand is part of the community, to creating a conversation and something that's more than just buying stuff. Um, and my final example, again, back to Shannon Duty Free, printing up some of those customer comments as part of the permanent point of sale. A really nice way to give customers a voice inside your retail store. Really nice example. So we're on to my final element. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. It's the final bit is technology. Now, I know this is a contentious element. Um, it's the one that scares people the most. What I want to show is that clearly there's massive involved, massive investment in technology. The pandemic has accelerated the rise to online and omni-channel. Um, we've also seen the massive increase in the use of smartphones and smartphone enabled retail. If you guys are using that, I absolutely want to see it. It's never been easier to do it. Uh, after a year of everyone getting used to scanning QR codes as part of checking in, more and more of the population are, uh, are competent to use it. We're absolutely going to see that increasing across retail. Um, a whole bunch of retailers really innovating. Nike powering ahead during the pandemic with digitally enabled retail. Um, you can use your Nike Plus app on your own phone to scan your own feet so that you get the perfect fit for sneakers. That then gets added to your digital profile. Fantastic digital innovation that then combines with the physical store. Nike, big brands doing it, big investment, but we're seeing it equally on the ground. We've already seen it in Ireland. Um, Specsavers in Dublin, their flagship, they were using this a couple of years ago in the awards. It was a really nice touch using the iPad to scan customers' faces and then recommend eyeglasses that fit. You can do absolutely combining personalization and technology at the same time in the optical sector, in the fashion sector, it doesn't matter what. And even if you don't want to use complicated, expensive devices, you can use the QR code to enable deeper, richer integration with the customer to then maybe mitigate them online. Um, Willow and Ennis using point of sale with QR codes so that you could actually scan the phone and see different ways to wear the look. Again, modeled by local influencers, tying into social media, creating an online and an offline community at the same time. That type of technology innovation is absolutely something that we're looking forward to. Um, and again, back to Evergreen, you know, there's no limit to what you can do. QR code, recipes, healthy recipes, bit of storytelling, bit of helpful curation, all of that power together, powered by technology. It's cheap, it's effective, it's easy to do. There's absolutely no excuse not to be doing it. Um, and my final example, back to Fabiani, you know, in the world of online retail where we're used to doing it, we're all buying on Amazon. What Amazon doesn't have is that personal touch. And as I said, it's never been a better time to be small, independent and nimble. And what I love about Fabiani's online orders, which she runs from the back of the store, is that every online order is boxed up like this with a sprig of lavender, with a handwritten note wrapped in string. Now there's absolutely no way that Amazon can compete with this. This is the competitive advantage that you have as a small independent retailer, even if you're trading online. So thank you very much for bearing with me. I've gone slightly over time. I hope that makes sense, those 10 pillars. You've got this presentation. You will have this presentation to look at. You'll have the 10 pillars document as well. You've got the, the, the PowerPoint, which should be self-explanatory. Um, good luck. Please photograph your stores as best as you can. Please think about how you are doing these elements um, in a really nice creative way and tell me about it. Um, sing your own praises. This is not just about winning an award. It's about celebrating retail, great retail in Ireland, celebrating the resilience after a terrible 18 months. Um, so look, thank you very much. Um, good luck. I'm looking forward to the next stage. Thanks, Matthew. That was fantastic as always. Um, look, I think I'm just sitting here going, wow, haven't we got some brilliant retailers in Ireland? Because it really does come across in some of those shots from previously. And I'm sure that your life has moved on and, and there's some more great examples that we'll find when we go out there uh, again in October. 
Um, I know there's a few questions come up. I think, look, at this stage, we'll probably answer most of them uh, individually. But one of the ones that did come up was around uh, uh, maybe putting a little video clip as part of the presentations from one or two. So uh, we'll come back to you on that one. But uh, I'm going back to your creative ways of enhancing your uh, application, Matthew. Uh, might be uh, a different, you know, different approaches. But look, guys, uh, if you've got any more questions, drop them in the in the chat box um, or email us uh, to info at retailexcellence.ie and we'll get back to you. Uh, and in the meantime, good luck. Thank you. And um, thanks again, Matthew, for your uh, fantastic presentation today. Pleasure. Good luck, guys. Bye for now. Thank you.